introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Suarez, who is a retired professor of psychiatry and the director of the section on law and psychiatry at UCLA. He's a former trustee of Americans United for Separation of Church and State and chairman of their education committee. He is also the outreach coordinator for the Center for Inquiry in Los Angeles. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Suarez. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yes, Good. we can. All right. Uh, do you want to give me a just the an individual picture here so I can see myself? That's what I'm trying to do, John. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to. If everyone goes into speaker view, and then I can also hide. I'm going to pick you out so you're you're spotlighted for everyone. Or should be. There we go. Okay. And John, let me know when you're ready to start your presentation. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm ready. Okay, so I'll pull up your slide presentation now. Not not yet. Let me say a few things and then we'll okay. go to the slides. Okay. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I wish I could be there in person, uh, although I hear that you're having a heat wave. Uh, today okay. isn't so bad here in Southern California, except we don't have water. Uh, and uh, so if I start coughing occasionally, it, you'll see that it's because the rationing doesn't allow me more than one and a half cups per day. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to meet with you. Uh, and uh, this is the first talk I've given in almost two years, be mostly because of the pandemic. And uh, when Fred first approached me, uh, I said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy. I don't have anything ready. And, and then, then I, then I you know, the usual pangs of guilt set in and I got back to Fred and said, well, maybe I can do a talk on blasphemy, which is that subject I have spoken about before. And in fact, I have a basically a ready lecture. And then I found the PowerPoint that we'll be using today, which is a little bit dated, but still is basically uh, pertinent to, to our discussion. So I said, count me in. And so here I am. Uh, uh, I don't know what else to say, but uh, I hope I'll, I'll be as brief as I can and still cover what I think is pertinent and I'll be available to for discussion and questions uh, as long as you want me. It's only it's only 10 o'clock or 10, 15 here in California, so I have the whole day. I've already done half a day's work. I got up early, did a number of things in the house, and then I went shopping. So I'm I'm in good shape. So uh, let's let's go with the slides, please. Okay, here we go. Uh, I think Don already uh, mentioned the pertinent things about me, uh, which are repeated in, the, in this slide. Uh, the uh, the topic or the subtopic, the medieval concept, which is still a very big problem. It today, I think is, is, is a good comment. And I think we'll, as I elaborate my points, you'll, you'll see what, what I'm referring to. Uh, next, please. Oh, um, I've been involved, as you saw, with Americans United for separation of church and state for many decades. I was on the board for quite a few years. I retired in favor of fresh blood uh, some years back, but uh, no church state person can uh, proceed with a lecture without revisiting the First Amendment. Otherwise, I tend, I risk losing my my credentials. Uh, but it's it's important always to to visit the First Amendment and issues like this because the First Amendment has several parts to it, as you can see on the slide. And the important thing today is that all of these sub 
parts to the to the amendment are affected by blasphemy laws and their application, as we will see uh, as we develop the discussion. Next, please. We're talking about blasphemy, which is a word that was coined into the English language all the way back in the 13th century. The basic definition is simple enough. It involves insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for God. It has become a part of the lexicon of every modern language. As we will see in the discussion, the concept has been expanded beyond religion, which was its original source, to sociopolitical contexts. There is a quote from Leonard Levy and uh, his book, Blasphemy of 1993. Over the centuries, the sanctions against blasphemy have inhibited not only religious, but also artistic, political, scientific, and literary expression. And uh, we will get to that very pointedly very soon. Next, please. There are a number of other words or concepts that have also survived and overlap to some degree with blasphemy. There is heresy, there is apostasy, there's idolatry, sacrilege, nonconformity, sedition, treason, profanity. Uh, I don't think we'll have a chance to practice all of those today, but maybe at the end we can certainly do a little practice of blasphemy if, <laughs> if you wish. Uh, following the Renaissance and the age of reason, the issue of blasphemy became mostly moot and not a very big deal in the Western world. This was uh, further uh, amplified or cemented uh, by the, uh, the passage of the radical First Amendment in the United States, which further, for the first time, clearly delineated the issues of freedom of religion and freedom of speech, etc. With regard to the United States, all challenges to blasphemy laws at the state level have been successful, but these have not been a big deal in our 200 plus years. The issue itself, interestingly, has never come up before the US Supreme Court. Now there are a few laws, a few states, that if you look through the small print in their constitution, you'll find some references to blasphemy, but again, those are not really pertinent, not really issues in today's US. Uh, next, please. However, the situation is very, very different in the Muslim world. Uh, there have always been uh, severe curbs on religious freedom and speech. And until uh, 1989 and beyond, the West had really not paid much attention to that. That, that was their problem. We have our own problems and that was that. Um, However, as the two worlds have come into greater contact by virtue of uh, not only better communication, but uh, the fact that the world is becoming, is shrinking, um, we, let's, um, let's begin with 1989. Salman Rushdie publishes the satanic verses, of course, in the West, and that triggers a fatwa by Ayatollah Khomeini uh, for his uh, obviously blasphemous uh, comments. And this led to a very difficult situation. Salman Rushdie had to go into hiding for many years. There were a few instances when he barely survived. Other people involved with the publication were not as uh, successful. There was a Japanese translator that was killed because of his 
involvement with the with the volume. And also in both Italy and Norway, uh, publishers were attacked uh, again for the for the same blasphemous uh, activity. In addition, uh, there were a number of uh, short films that were uh, that the, the three of them that I am aware of uh, are listed here. Submission is a 10 minute Dutch film from 2004. Fitna, uh, I'm waiting for that to, <laughs> I can't read the, Fitna is a Dutch film, I forget the year, 2008. And Innocence of Muslims was a USA film, 14 minutes in 2012. Now, you're not going to find any of these on Netflix. I think I've seen them. Uh, I think I've seen most of them and in the past. Well, they're not great stuff, but the, the important thing is that every time uh, every one of those publications uh, triggered a lot of violent reaction in the Muslim world. Uh, so we are beginning uh, to see the the unfortunate interaction or negative interaction between the two cultures, uh, as I say, beginning in 89, although that by itself was a single event which sort of died down over time. And these films were not that all that uh, well uh, uh, distributed, so they were not a big deal either. But then comes, uh, next please, the turning point to, to the present, I believe, is September 11. Here we had an instance of terrorism in the name of Islam. And the, the reaction from Muslim countries immediately after September 11 was one, many of them expressed sympathy and, and, and condolences to what had happened. But in terms of actual condemnation, that was more muted. Uh, it was not as, as uh, open or as uh, forceful as we would have liked. And because of the backlash in the West against Islam and Islamic countries, uh, this did not set well in the Muslim world, as you can imagine. And the governments uh, throughout the Muslim world responded to that backlash by demanding that the West suppress and punish those within their borders who dare to insult Islam. In other words, they were saying, you are attacking us, you are bad-mouthing us, uh, you have a responsibility, they claimed, you, the West, the Western countries, uh, to uh, control that, that speech, suppress it as you see fit, but it's it's not it, it's not acceptable to us to be uh, attacked as it's happening uh, throughout the West. Next, let's talk a little bit about the Muslim world, uh, particularly in the context of of the blasphemy. Let's talk about the organization of the Islamic Conference, the OIC. It was renamed in two thousand eleven as the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. I, I would safely bet that not all of you have heard of this organization. It was established in 1969 by Saudi Arabia. Today, it consists of 57 countries with a population of close to 2 billion by now. It is, second, it is the second largest world organization second only to the UN itself, and has permanent representation in the UN. In other words, uh, simply by virtue of their numbers, they are a very uh, a powerful organization within the UN. It considers itself the collective voice of the Muslim world. Whereas the West views religious freedom from the vantage point, is there a way I can, this window is in my way here. That's better. Um, where the West reviews religious freedom 
from the vantage point of the right of the individual, the OIC puts the focus on representing and protecting religion itself. In fact, in 1990, in a meeting in Cairo, the OIC took issue with the uh, 1948 UN Declaration of Human Rights on the basis that it, uh, rep it uh, carried or represented a, a Western bias. Later on in 2008, the OIC revised its chapter and now supported the Declaration of Human Rights and other international laws. The problem is, however, that this, even though this was acceptance at the highest level of the OIC, the actual changes and uh, modifications have not trickled down uh, to constitutional, the constitutional and legislative changes within the individual member states. In other words, the OIC revised its, its uh, writing, its, its constitution, but uh, the, the, the thoughts, the, the uh, ideas behind this uh, adaptation have not trickled down to, to the different countries. And of course, we know the situation in Saudi Arabia, Iran, et cetera. Next, please. I'll read this in case some of you have trouble reading. The expectations of those calling for the internationalization of legal bans on blasphemy can be readily surmised from an analysis of the restrictions already in place in their contemporary societies. Not only are religious, our freedom of religion and speech in jeopardy, but the suppression extends to political, social, and academic freedoms. If you, um, years ago, I remember a report about the, the fact the academic situation in all the universities in Muslim countries, and I think we in the West would be very shocked about the absence of academic freedom, the restrictions of what can and cannot be taught or discussed, Etc. If we look at things from the vantage point of uh, what happened in Christendom, or at least in the West, after the Protestant Reformation, we can readily see that stifling independent and innovative thinking perpetuates ideological conformity. This is not a, 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 a revelation because all suppressive laws have as their ultimate purpose, the maintenance of power and the preservation of the status quo. As Marshall and Shea comment in their, as you see there, I say recent book, uh, 2011, you can see that this, this PowerPoint is about eight years old and in their book, Silence, which is very worth uh, reading. Uh, they say, in other words, blasphemy laws suppress the very voices that seek to reconcile the Muslim world with modern pluralism. Uh, to put it another way, <clears throat> I think the Muslim world still needs the equivalent of a Protestant revolution or reformation, as well as a, I would say both a Renaissance and, a, and a, the a birth of a, of the, age of reason. Next, please. Interestingly, the Quran and Hadith neither mentions blasphemy. Blasphemy is found in Sharia law. They have been in existence for a long time, but they became more prominent and more noticeable uh, throughout the Muslim world as fundamentalists gain power in the different, in the major countries. Again, Saudi Arabia, uh, Islam, uh, uh, Iran, uh, et cetera. Patterns have emerged with negative implications for basic human rights, political and religious freedoms, and even social stability. Those in power 
claiming to rule in the name of Islam are direct beneficiaries of this oppressive legislation, which is often vague and widely applicable. The legislation that, uh, for example, blasphemy laws and related issues are very vague, which allow uh, a great deal of freedom for the government to be suppressive whenever they feel like it. And there's very little that the victim or the accused can do to, to help himself and typically win the case in court. Uh, next. As I said already, there are very wide definitions and many of them uh, very vague of the, of the concept of blasphemy throughout the Muslim world. In all Muslim majority countries, there are restrictions to neutralize religious and political reformers. And uh, that is, as I say, very disturbing. And that has not changed uh, over the last several decades. The government often does not have to intervene directly because there are zealots and vigilantes who are given free reign to exercise the law and punish the blasphemers and the lawbreakers so the government can stay in the background and still get their, their results uh, readily from these uh, private or non-governmental groups. At the international level, for several decades now, the UN has tried to do a balancing act between preserving human rights and also trying to get some handle on blasphemy laws and laws that suppress uh, different types of speech. This is a difficult process, as you can imagine. Uh, but uh, the, the, re the end result of, of bans of any free speech and uh, suppression of religious freedom is that longstanding and legitimate subjects of inquiry and debate are done away with, uh, do not, are not allowed to, to exist. Newly minted Western restrictions spare authoritarian regimes criticism from abroad, reinforcing domestic suppression. In other words, to the extent that we in the West suppress uh, speech and criticism, uh, the beneficiaries are primarily those authoritarian regimes in the Muslim world who are, who are not experiencing any pressure whatsoever to change from the West. Next, please. Again, I'll read this. Resolutions banning defamation of religions aim to legitimize the notion that critical speech is a human rights violation and not the protected exercise of a human right. The OIC stopped promoting them in 2011. And so the UN Human Rights Council was rendered a little less conflicted and has not had to adopt any resolution on this issue since 1999. Nevertheless, the focus has shifted to religious hate speech, which by, anti, uh, by outlawing anti-religious speech, in effect, oppresses religion freedom itself. The wording of hate speech laws varies widely from country to country. I'm talking about the West throughout Europe but most have acceded to pressure and adopted religious hate speech bans. Next, please. Uh, here are some dated examples. There are newer ones that I haven't had a chance to research, but they're not that much different. Since World War II, of course, we know in Germany that there were severe restrictions on uh, for anti-Nazism purposes, uh, and uh, there were uh, 
that, that curved uh, ra racial and religious hatred. Uh, originally in Germany, um, I think the, the, back in the late 40s, uh, the, uh, the idea was to, to protect against xenophobia and anti-Semitism. Today, in the countries and throughout Europe that have such hate speech laws, they have been expanded and manipulated to criminalize speech that is deemed insulting. The standards are nebulous and they are not the same from country to country. And of course, you can imagine there have been unintended results. Next. In Denmark, there is a law expressing against expressing and spreading racial hatred. And the, a politician was indicted for making anti-Islam statements. In France, uh, the press law of 1981 was passed, which uh, uh, tried to suppress incitement to racial discrimination, hatred, or violence. In the Netherlands, uh, the very right-wing politician Geert Wilders was indicted for public comments against Islam and the film, one of the films that I mentioned now earlier, uh, entitled The Koran. In the United Kingdom, I don't know the year, but it's at least 10 years ago, an atheist, Harry Taylor, was uh, given a six month prison sentence for drawings satirizing both Christianity and Islam. In Israel, in 1997, a Russian immigrant was given a two year prison term for drawings that mocked Muhammad. Next. You all remember, I'm sure, the Charlie Hebdo incident in which uh, the offices of the cartoon, the magazine, was attacked, 12 were killed, and uh, uh, Sh Charlie Hebdo, of course, was uh, uh, satirized all religions. In 2009, it fired a writer uh, for speech criticizing Jews. There were, they, the attack on the office itself was to avenge cartoons of the prophet, the prophet Muhammad that they had printed. There were subsequent free speech and press demonstrations in France. And there was the, uh, the arrest of Dieudonné, the comedian uh, who was known for anti-Zionist remarks along with 54 others for condoning terrorism. In Copenhagen, uh, there was a, an attack at a free speech debate, one dead, three injured. The target was the Swedish cartoonist Lars Vilks. Uh, he had uh, published a 2007 cartoon depicting Mohammed as a dog. We'll see that in a minute. And there have been numerous attempts uh, by Muslim uh, 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 followers against uh, 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 perceived uh, attacks on, 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 on the Muslim religion. Next. Here is the uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, cartoon that uh, the cover that appeared after the attack. And on the right is the Vilks uh, drawing of Muhammad as a dog. Uh, and here's a very interesting quote from, by Glenn Greenwald. It's free speech if it involves ideas I like or attacks groups I dislike. But it's something different when I'm the one who is offended. Next. Now let's turn to the United States. And this is an important contrast. And I, uh, I think as, as an American, uh, I am proud that we in the United States have remained committed to freedom of expression as guaranteed by the First Amendment. Generally, hate speech per se, including blasphemy, remains constitutionally protected. I have a uh, quote here from the 
International Religious Freedom Report that is issued periodically by the U.S. State Department. This one is from 2012. I'm sure there have been others without change more recently uh, in which uh, the State Department affirms religious freedom, including the right not to believe while condemning blasphemy and apostasy laws. And this, I think, is one of the points that I want to make today, that whereas Europe has given in to the pressure from the Muslim world for anti-speech, anti-hate speech, we have remained strong. Uh, there may be differences uh, culturally and situationally between Europe and us, uh, but I think the our reverence to the First Amendment has held up, and uh, I think we were the better for it. Uh, next. This is my last slide. This is my own comment here. And uh, I apologize for rushing through this, but that leaves more time for discussion and comments. Those of us who have come to marvel at and depend on all the elements of the First Amendment should welcome the United States resistance at least thus far, for pressures to enact laws that diminish our freedoms of speech and religion. Mortgaging our core values for the sake of appeasing those who do not share them is an arrangement that will render us neither safe nor freer. And I am, I'd like to end my talk by a wonderful quote by G.B. Shaw, all great truths begin as blasphemies. Thank you for your attention and I hope we can have a spirited discussion to follow. I hope so. Dr. Suarez, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Remind everyone to, if you have comments or chats or questions for Dr. Suarez, please enter the chat function. I see a few. Uh, I would like to take just a moment at this point to add something else as a postscript from CDHS as an example of how blasphemy laws are applied in current times. This is something I saw recently from Humanist International where Mubarak Bala, who's the president of the Nigerian Humanist Association, was charged in August 3rd, 2021, which is just you know a week ago, within the last week, for the blasphemous content of five Facebook posts he, from 2020. He's been jailed for over 462 days prior to these charges being filed, much of that time without access to representation. Uh, he's because of the state he was charged in, if he could be, if he were a Muslim, he could be tried under Sharia law, which would, one of the penalties would be death. Uh, his uh, legal representation vehemently argues that he's not uh, a Muslim. So it doesn't, Sharia law doesn't apply, but hopefully that will play out the case. Uh, I know this is just an example again of what's going on, how blasphemy laws are being applied, how blasphemy laws can be applied in current times. And I'm yeah, and I, I think the it, the the, uh, the Bala's case also uh, shows and represents how relatively ineffective we are in the West to influence these developments outside of the West, and this is in Nigeria, but. Uh, we have countless examples throughout the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm going to stop the screen share and go back to some of the question comments we have. Uh, first off, uh, Sherry pointed out that early on pangs of guilt. She thought blasphemy was tied to religion. And now, and so I'm now confused. It's not just religion, though, is it, John? No, no. It, it started as a religious concept. Religion, like any authoritarian uh, practice, uh, didn't particularly care for people asking questions, uh, being critical, uh, being even uh, uh, beyond critical. And so it was easy to, within the context of the authoritarian structure of religion, to enact laws that said, if you, if you have any quarrel with us and you voice it, uh, we're not going to like it and you're going to suffer for it. So it started as a clear religious concept. 
but it was uh, incorporated by authoritarians in any context to extend the concept, not only to religion, but to social and cultural issues as well. So that in any uh, authoritarian country where, the, where blasphemy is, a, is an issue, you're talking about everything from free speech, uh, uh, academic freedom, uh, publishing, uh, meetings. It's a sociopolitical issue as well. So blasphemy has been expanded to our human detriment, in my opinion, but it is something that started as religious has become uh, much more uh, encompassing. Mm -hmm. I have a, another question for you. I think you sort of touched on it during your presentation, but if you could amplify, it would be great. And my question would be, how can we balance fighting against or trying to uh, overturn blasphemy laws while at the same time minimizing the black backlash from those that permit, pro promote blasphemy laws? You know, it's again, the example you say, it's hard for us to, in the West to reach into Muslim countries to get them to change their, change their laws. Is there a way to do that or things that can be done to help? Well, I, I think... Frankly, in, in the Muslim world, I don't think things will change uh, because everything that's, that's in effect now is very much works against modernism, against uh, uh, blending with the West, etc. So that the only hope as, that I see is eventually, and I don't see it on the horizon at the moment, is for the Muslim world to undergo the same thing that Christianity underwent with the Protestant Reformation and then the Renaissance, uh, where things changed radically. Religion didn't get wiped out totally, which some of us <laughs> regret, but uh, at least it was relegated to a limited function within society. That's, un until that happens in, in, in the in the Muslim world and in the governments within the Muslim world, I don't think we're gonna see significant change. And therefore our own ability to influence, uh, you know, we, there are many people in the Muslim world who have seen the light, if we can say that, but they pay the price heavily, as you see the example of Mubarak Bala and many others. Uh, I think I mentioned to either you, Don, or, or, or Fred, that the Center for Inquiry has been involved with the uh, trying to protect and rescue journalists and others uh, throughout the world who have been threatened and who are on the run because of things they said or published. And we have been successful in, in uh, allowing them to flee the country and to find refuge in the West. And we're con that's a program that's very active now. But this is, you know, a, a drop in the bucket. Uh, <clears throat> it's still very dangerous to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to speak out in many, many countries around the world. Well, it's interesting. You, I'm glad you brought up Center for Inquiry when I was looking for information to put up with the picture of you and your lemur on your shoulder. Uh, to accompany that so that the lemur wouldn't take center stage. Oh, uh, well, no, I, I was willing to give it equal, equal time. Uh, okay. the, that picture, uh, my wife and I were traveling in Madagascar, which is one, you know, I, I rank places in the world. Norway is number one for me. Madagascar is second and the Galapagos Islands is third. At any rate, we were in Madagascar and we were, we took a little boat to an island, which is a natural reserve. And we were walking as a group. And I feel something on my shoulder. And I look and there it is. The lemur is right there. Uh, you know, it was nice to see a, an old relative. And uh, luckily someone took the picture. And uh, I have been using it ever since, pointing out, of course, that I'm the one on the right as you look at the picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was, but when I, when I, when I was looking for something to go along with this wonderful picture of you and your friend, uh, I came across International Blasphemy Day, 
which is coming up on September 30th. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that Center for Inquiry supports as one of the sponsors of that or promotes it. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, but you don't have to wait to, to, for September 30th to blaspheme. You can blaspheme anytime. <laughs> Uh, we, I, many of us probably make it a practice. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, I had a comment here from Frank Robinson that many blasphemers in Muslim countries have been violently persecuted. Uh, he notes that Secular Rescue is a U.S. organization at Center for Inquiry aimed at assisting and protecting such people, including relocating them to safety. Yeah, that's what I just mentioned, yeah. Okay. And, uh, Mira and we've... We've been amazingly successful. And that is, every every life saved is is very worthwhile. Particularly, these people who are so courageous. Uh, I, think about it. How many of us would dare to to speak out openly and, and promote and proselytize our ideas in a setting, uh, say Iran? Uh, I'm I'm not sure I have I would have the courage. I'd try to get out if I could. But I'm not sure I would be that willing to risk my life for a, a certain uh, punishment and death with very little chance of being able to talk my way out of it. So Mira Peck asked a question and raised her hand, virtual hand. So her question is, the ex-Muslims of Nor North America, eczema, eczema, advocate religious dissent and secular values. How effective do you think they are in fighting blasphemy laws? And Mira, if you'd like to amplify, unmute yourself and go ahead. I think my question, uh, um, well, following on what uh, uh, Dr. Suarez said, it takes tremendous courage to stick your neck out uh, against such violent uh, persecution, which is, you know, even for people who are in the West, and who like the people, the uh, um, filmmaker in um, in the Netherlands, who was killed because he was working with Ayan Hirsi Ali to make the film, um, uh, and so uh, the organization of ex-Muslims of North America. I think those people are very brave, and um, I just wonder how effective they are in fighting this, uh, the, the laws against blasphemy and the persecution of atheists and intellectuals and so forth. I wonder if Dr. Suarez has, a, uh, has an opinion on that. Well, uh, I think uh, Muslims in the West, many of them have uh, re uh, rejected their religion and become secular free thinkers like we are, uh, and uh, have uh, blended well into the West. I think uh, the, the Muslims are found everywhere in, in both con all continents. Uh, however, they're, and uh, what I found is that many of them are a little reluctant to, to interact freely. There are organizations, of course, that are very active in uh, representing Muslims and trying to become part of the of our the Western dialogue, but um, I found not only my personal example that I'm going to give in a moment, and but um, others I have heard say that uh, Muslim groups uh, and their uh, and their temples uh, had tend to be isolated and are leery or suspicious of, of opening up and interacting with, with the rest of us. For example, here in my, where I live, years ago, I wanted to, I was working on, on a number of religious issues and, and I went to the, uh, to the local temple, which is only five minutes away from my home and talked to a few people and told them who I was and what I was up to and all that. And interestingly, they never got back to me. And I tried again and they never got back to me. And I've heard others uh, describe that as well. And it's a shame because I think that uh, a, a great deal could be accomplished if they were more open and more 
amenable. And I understand their reluctance because anti-Muslim sentiment was, was and remains very, uh, very prominent. Uh, it's been replaced more recently by anti-Asian <laughs> sentiment. And of course, there is always anti-Jewish sentiments and, 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 and many antis. Yeah. But it's unfortunate because it would be nice if they would join the community more freely, at least in those instances where it's not happening. But, uh, but, but the, to answer the original question, whatever is happening in the West is not filtering down to, to the Muslim world itself. And uh, this is very discouraging. And I don't know uh, what, uh, what we in the West can do I mean, there are many things we can do, but I don't know of anything really uh, that would be very effective in terms of promoting more freedom and less authoritarianism in the, in the Muslim world. At, at the moment, of course, we're, <laughs> we're bogged down with fighting authoritarianism within the Western world, and our own democracy is, is, a, it, is in a great deal of danger, I believe, and uh, we have very bad trends throughout. Take a look at, at Hungary, for example, is the latest example in the news. They're really, they, what's happening there is very, very frightening to democracy. So we've got our own, our hands full with, with uh, keeping our house intact within the West. And uh, we're not able or willing to to spend a lot of energy trying to change the Muslim world. And uh, so I think the, the status quo is not likely to change radically quickly in the, in the foreseeable future. Okay. I, just want to, oh. I just want to add to my question, to my question or comment that uh, people who are members of this ex-Muslims of America, there are also ex-Muslims of Canada, ex-Muslims of uh, Norway, they're quite open about their membership in the organization. They uh, speak at conferences of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, of American Humanist Association. So there are Muslims who don't go to mosques. And, uh, but I agree with you about, uh, it, this is a drop in the bucket against this, uh, this, this wave of authoritarianism all over the world, including the United States. And I appreciate your comment, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, they, 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 they're wonderful Muslim organizations and they're trying very hard to, to blend with, with, with the West, so to speak, not give up their identity, but just blend and be part of us. However, very little of that is known in the in the Islamic world. Thank you. Uh, Hani had a question for you uh, about are there examples of blasphemy laws in Judaism, Judaism and the non Abrahamic religions? Uh, I'm not, <laughs> I hope someone can can tackle that. I, I am not an expert on religion. Um, and so I, I pass. Is there anyone who can contribute to that or answer that question? Not really. No, not in uh, at least. We know if we talk about Israel, uh, we know that they have anti-hate speech laws. And in fact, I think I had an example. It's a dated example, but it's still, it's still the case. So they, Israel is, is like Europe. They, there are anti-speech laws, uh, which obviously would apply not only to Judaism, but in the case that I cited, it was a, an individual who made some uh, disparaging comments I forget the example against Islam and maybe Christianity, and uh, that uh, individual spent some time in jail. Only Iranic religions they have these blasphemic uh, rules, but other than that, uh, you know, mostly 
Uh, Could you speak louder, please? Uh, Buddhism doesn't have anything or Chinese religion. Uh, they, basically, they are all atheists. At, they are atheists in general. They don't have God to you know, be insulted or anything. Uh, only the Ibrahimic religion is the one they have all this uh, problem and especially created this uh, these problems in Christian religion. And of course, after that, it just uh, spread it into Islam. And uh, of course, Jewish has the same thing. That's my, my opinion or my knowledge about that. OK, thank you, Jonas, for adding that. Uh, had a question from Sue who asked, shouldn't we distinguish between hate speech against religious people versus critical speech about the, the content of religious ideas? I'm, I'm not sure there's a difference. Uh, the, uh, we can speak critically and, and uh, Give me the question again. I, I didn't find the difference between the two. Distinguish between hate speech versus critical speech. So hate speech, which is against religious people or critical speech about the content of religious ideas. Well, hate speech doesn't accomplish much. However, I, you know, I'm a firm believer that uh, you're entitled to express it. And, and of course, uh, they, we always have the, the, the problem of the continuum between speech and action. And it's a very, it's a continuum. It's not a sharp division. And at some point, obviously, you have to draw a line and you have to take measures because action and violence are not acceptable, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, I, I think... <laughs> Uh, as a free thinker, I welcome a discussion and an analysis of anything, including religion. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think we're, we're able to do that here, although there are, always, there are always elements within the West that are not happy with that either. And, and luckily, most of the time, they're, they remain in the fringe. But uh, as the country goes more authoritarian, uh, there is a danger that uh, such suppression will become more more prominent. Okay, Eugene had a question, sort of along similar, to, to draw some of the thing your topic you're just talking about. His question is, how much are non-Western government actors using private technological platforms like Facebook or Twitter? to enforce blasphemy or other speech restrictions? Uh, I'm, sure that's, I'm sure that's going on. I, I'm not uh, knowledgeable. Uh, I'm not knowledgeable about technology in general. And I, I can't answer that question, the extent of it. But I think the, uh, the authoritarian regimes are using it and are also suppressing uh, the use of uh, social interactions like uh, all those platforms. Uh, and uh, every once in a while, you hear an authoritarian regime where they have stopped the internet. Uh, that happened in Cuba, for example. Uh, I'm familiar because I'm Cuban. And uh, when the demonstrations reared up uh, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, one of the first steps of the government was to to outlaw and, and black out the, the internet, which is not all that prominent to begin with. And it's and they're the I'm in touch with my cousin and others in Cuba who are trying to find other ways to revive the internet uh, to from what the suppression by the government. But the same in the same in any authoritarian country. Uh, they use the techniques to uh, promote their message 
and by the same token, they suppress and outlaw and and keep an eye on on the same mechanisms that may promote the opposite viewpoint. But beyond that, I I don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't have any other questions in the chat for you, Dr. Suarez. Uh, I don't see anybody's hands raised. Does anybody else have something they'd like to ask Dr. Suarez? I basically just have a comment. Um, having grown up in New York City in a diverse ethnic melting pot, you know, there were always differences and there were always tolerances. Um, and I'm seeing, I guess, different layers of this. I'm seeing international layers where, you know, people's disagreements with the main culture or religion puts their mortality in, in danger. It puts their families in danger. I mean, we're talking about really strict, you do not, you know, divert from the prescribed path. And then I'm seeing you know, you have a background in psychology. I'm seeing a place where in America, there's more room for differences, um, but always we can't back somebody into a corner where they can't get out of it, you know? And I've never been in a discussion with people while I share the, you know, atheist agnostic um, separation of state and, and, and government ideas, I've never been in a position where I wished to tell people, no, this religion or your religion or any religion is, you know, um, as legitimate as cartoons, because I feel that if someone finds a path that gives them um, a good moral footing, then you know, go for it, you know, as long as you don't use that to judge others. Um, but I see, I guess, differences when you look globally and when you look um, across our country. You know, th there was someone in the chat room that I was having conversation with who is from India where her disagreement would be, her or him, where their, their disagreement would affect their life. You know, and I grew up in a culture where I could, you know, tell my religious, you know, uh, people, you know, that I don't believe in God and that was okay. There was enough freedom and intellectualism where you could culturally belong to a religion but not embrace all the dogma. Uh, so, you know, I found your, your talk very interesting, but I, I see that there are big differences when we look on a community level, on a national level, or on a global level. And uh, globally, we've gone nuts. I mean, you know, we, we've just, um, you know, the idea of killing people who don't believe in something is so, in my opinion, opposite what I believe most of the precepts are of most of the religions. You know, I, I still find it very, um, confusing, you know, that main major, so many major religions believe in God and believe that it leads to good things. And yet, if you don't believe in my flavor of God, you're damned, you're going to burn, we're going to kill you. Um, I, I guess I just get confused by that. Um, but that, that's just, you know, some comments, John, if you have anything that you want to respond to? Sure. Um, I think those of us who grew up in a truly mixed setting, as you're describing in New York City, I lived in New York City eight years through uh, college and medical school. And, uh, but I also uh, lived in other places. I've always lived in a, in a place that was heterogeneous. And I, I think those of us who have who had that chance by by chance uh, uh, are not really aware of how privileged we are. We are so much broader thinking than people who have grown up in a small town with one uh, or maybe a single religion and a single ideology. And you can imagine how difficult it is 
for those, even though they may be intelligent, even though they get an education, yes. to begin to see a broader picture. Uh, but that's the case. And, uh, and uh, it's a shame that not everyone can experience that. I think things like the Olympics are very helpful in that regard. Yes. There are, num there are a number of photos and, uh, and videos from the Olympic that were really, really almost brought me to tears uh, about uh, international uh, friendship and communication and acceptance. Uh, but by the same token, those I, I was raised as a free thinker. So I didn't have to go through the process of making the break with religion to into secularism. And so I'm sure that I am less empathetic than those who have gone through that process simply because I didn't go through it. And I think at times I become a little impatient, a little intolerant. Uh, the, the latest example being the, 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 whole, the whole discussion about vaccines. <laughs> As a psychiatrist, I'm supposed to be understanding and look at every different angle and perspective, but there are times when I, I reach my limit and I really become very angry and very intolerant of those who are really harming all of us through sheer ignorance and stupidity. So it depends on our, our own personal experience dictates a lot of as to how tolerant and understanding we are. And, uh, and I think we should always pinch ourselves and say, gee, I'm, I'm glad I am who I am and where I'm at. And, uh, I hope to live up to those principles. And that we don't always, but we try. Don, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, the Protestant uh, Reformation was not an attack on Christianity. It was more of an uh, interpretation of the gospel and attack on uh, corruption and within the Catholic church. So within the, these Muslim, and the Muslim religion has been uh, uh, more tolerant and less tolerant over the centuries. And is there a movement now within the Muslim countries uh, uh, to uh, over the interpretation of the Quran and the Muslim teaching? And is there some point where uh, if you don't agree with the mainline Muslim thought, is that considered blasphemy, even though uh, the person himself may be considered a Muslim? Well, th that depends country to country. Uh, because as I said, the, the laws the blasphemy and related laws are written differently in different settings. And most of them are very, very vague, which allows, you know, when you want to get at, when, when you want to get somebody, it's not difficult to, to do by, by, by uh, applying the law. As to, yes, you, you're correct, of course, uh, about the Protestant Reformation. And to my awareness, there is not a significant there are many individuals and maybe some secret groups and, and underground groups and all that who would lo love to achieve that. But at the moment, I don't see a, a viable, significant movement that would replicate or do anything uh, similar to, to the Protestant Reformation in Europe uh, at the time. And that's, that's what's depressing. Uh, I don't see the status quo changing, and uh, it, it is sad and pathetic that so many people are so repressed, and those who have any courage at all and speak out uh, bear the brunt of the harshest punishment, and that's continuing, and um, I don't know what we can do. So on that happy note, maybe we should all curse more. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the uh, well, uh, thank you, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I always learn, uh, which is the purpose of any webinar, uh, from the comments of others and the responses of others. And I hope you picked up a few pointers that you hadn't thought about or knew about from me. And uh, um, I admire your monthly meetings. Uh, as you may know, there are some organizations that have not been able to keep up their regular meetings because of the pandemic. 
but I respect your doing so and and uh, keep up the good work. And maybe one day 